Section 5 of A Little Tour of France by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I hardly know what to say about the tone of Langer, which, though I have left it to the end of my sketch, formed the objective point of the first excursion I made from Tours. Langer is rather dark and grey. It is perhaps the simplest and most severe of all the castles of the Loire. I don't know why I should have gone to see it before any other, unless it be because I remember the Duchesse de Langer, who figures in several of Balzac's novels, and found this association very potent. The Duchesse de Langer is a somewhat transparent fiction, but the castle from which Balzac borrowed the title of his heroine is an extremely solid fact. My doubt just above, as to whether I should pronounce it exceptionally grey, comes from my having seen it under a sky which made most things look dark. I have, however, a very kindly memory of that moist and melancholy afternoon, which was much more autumnal than many of the days that followed it. Langer lies down the Loire, near the river, on the opposite side from Tours, and to go to it you will spend half an hour in the train. You pass on the way the Chateau de Luynes, which, with its round towers catching the afternoon light, looks uncommonly well on a hill at a distance. You pass also the ruins of the castle of saint mar the ancestral dwelling of the young favourite of Louis the Thirteenth, the victim of Richelieu, the hero of Alfred de Vigny's novel, which is usually recommended to young ladies engaged in the study of French. Langer is very imposing and decidedly sombre. It marks the transition from the architecture of defence to that of elegance. It rises, massive and perpendicular, out of the centre of the village to which it gives its name, and which it entirely dominates, so that, as you stand before it, in the crooked and empty street, there is no resource for you but to stare up at its heavy, overhanging cornice, and at the huge towers surmounted with extinguishers of slate. If you follow this street to the end, however, you encounter in abundance the usual embellishments of a French village little ponds or tanks, with women on their knees on the brink, pounding and thumping a lump of saturated linen, brown old crones, the tone of whose facial hide makes their nightcaps, worn by day, look dazzling, little alleys perforating the thickness of a row of cottages, and showing you behind as a glimpse the vividness of a green garden. In the rear of the castle rises a hill which must formerly have been occupied by some of its appurtenances, and which indeed is still partly enclosed within its court. You may walk round this eminence, which, with the small houses of the village at its base, shuts in the castle from behind. The enclosure is not defiantly guarded, however, for a small rough path which you presently reach leads up to an open gate. This gate admits you to a vague and rather limited park, which covers the crest of the hill, and through which you may walk into the gardens of the castle. These gardens, of small extent, confront the dark walls with their brilliant parterre, and covering the gradual slope of the hill, form, as it were, the fourth side of the court. This is the stateliest view of the chateau, which looks to you sufficiently grim and grey, as after asking leave of a neat young woman who sallies out to learn your errand, you sit there on a garden bench, and take the measure of the three tall towers attached to this inner front, and forming severally the cage of a staircase. The huge bracketed cornice, one of the features of Langer, which is merely ornamental, as it is not machicolated, though it looks so, is continued on the inner face as well. The whole thing has a fine feudal air, though it was erected on the ruins of feudalism. The main event in the history of the castle is the marriage of Anne of Brittany to her first husband, Charles the Eighth, which took place in its great hall in 1491. Into this great hall we were introduced by the neat young woman, into this great hall and into sundry other halls, winding staircases, galleries, chambers. The Ciceroni of Langer is in too great a hurry. The fact is pointed out in the excellent Guy Joanne. This ill-dissimulated vice, however, is to be observed in the country of the Loire, in every one who carries a key. It is true that at Langer there is no great occasion to indulge in the tourist's weakness of dawdling, for the apartments, though they contain many curious odds and ends of antiquity, are not of first-rate interest. 
They are cold and musty, indeed, with that touching smell of old furniture, as all apartments should be through which the insatiate American wanders in the rear of a bored domestic, pausing to stare at a faded tapestry or to read the name on the frame of some simpering portrait. To return to Tours, my companion and I had counted on a train which, as is not uncommon in France, existed only in the Indicateur des Chemins de Fer, and instead of waiting for another, we engaged a vehicle to take us home. A sorry carriole or patache it proved to be, with the accessories of a lumbering white mare and a little wizened ancient peasant, who had put on, in honour of the occasion, a new blouse of extraordinary stiffness and blueness. We hired the trap of an energetic woman, who put it to with her own hands, women in Touraine and the Blaisois appearing to have the best of it in the business of letting vehicles, as well as in many other industries. There is, in fact, no branch of human activity in which one is not liable in France to find a woman engaged. Women, indeed, are not priests, but priests are, more or less, women. They are not in the army, it may be said, but then they are the army. They are very formidable. In France one must count with the women. The drive back from Langer de Tours was long, slow, cold. We had an occasional spatter of rain. But the road passes most of the way close to the Loire, and there was something in our jog-trot through the darkening land beside the flowing river which it was very possible to enjoy. Chapter 10 The consequence of my leaving to the last my little mention of Loche is that space and opportunity fail me, and yet a brief and hurried account of that extraordinary spot would after all be in best agreement with my visit. We snatched a fearful joy, my companion and I, the afternoon we took the train for Loche. The weather this time had been terribly against us. Again and again a day that promised fair became hopelessly foul after lunch. At last we determined that if we could not make this excursion in the sunshine, we would make it with the aid of our umbrellas. We grasped them firmly and started for the station, where we were detained an unconscionable time by the evolutions outside of certain trains laden with liberated and exhilarated conscripts, who, their term of service ended, were about to be restored to civil life. The trains in Touraine are provoking. They serve as little as possible for excursions. If they convey you one way at the right hour, it is on the condition of bringing you back at the wrong. They either allow you far too little time to examine the castle or the ruin, or they leave you planted in front of it for periods that outlast curiosity. They are perverse, capricious, exasperating. It was a question of our having but an hour or two at Loche, and we could ill afford to sacrifice to accidents. One of the accidents, however, was that the rain stopped when we got there, leaving behind it a moist mildness of temperature and a cool and lowering sky which were in perfect agreement with the grey old city. Loche is certainly one of the greatest impressions of the traveller in central France, the largest cluster of curious things that presents itself to his sight. It rises above the valley of the Indre, the charming stream set in meadows and sedges, which wanders through the province of Berry and through many of the novels of Madame Georges Champ, lifting from the summit of a hill which it covers to the base a confusion of terraces, ramparts, towers, and spires. Having but little time, as I say, we scaled the hill amain, and wandered briskly through this labyrinth of antiquities. The rain had decidedly stopped, and save that we had our train on our minds, we saw Loche to the best advantage. We enjoyed that sensation with which the conscientious tourist is, or ought to be, well acquainted, and for which, at any rate, he has a formula in his rough-and-ready language. We experienced, as they say, most odious of verbs, an agreeable disappointment. We were surprised and delighted. We had not suspected that Loche was so good. I hardly know what is best there. The strange and impressive little collegial church, with its Romanesque atrium or narthex, its doorways covered with primitive sculpture of the richest kind, its treasure of a so-called pagan altar embossed with fighting warriors, its three pyramidal domes, so unexpected, so sinister, which I have not met elsewhere in church architecture, 
or the huge square keep of the eleventh century the most cliff-like tower i remember whose immeasurable thickness i did not penetrate or the subterranean mysteries of two other less striking but not less historic dungeons into which a terribly imperative little cicerone introduced us with the aid of downward ladders ropes torches warnings and extended hands and many fearful anecdotes all in impervious darkness these horrible prisons of loche at an incredible distance below the daylight were a favoured resort of louis the eleventh and were for the most part i believe constructed by him one of the towers of the castle is garnished with the hooks or supports of the celebrated iron cage in which he confined the cardinal la balue who survived so much longer than might have been expected this extraordinary mixture of seclusion and exposure all these things form part of the castle of loche whose enormous enceinte covers the whole of the top of the hill and abounds in dismantled gateways in crooked passages in winding lanes that lead to postern doors in long facades that look upon terraces interdicted to the visitor who proceeds with irritation that they command magnificent views these views are the property of the sub-prefect of the department who resides at the chateau de loche and who has also the enjoyment of a garden a garden compressed and curtailed as those of old castles that perch on hilltops are apt to be containing a horse chestnut tree of fabulous size a tree of a circumference so vast and so perfect that the whole population of loche might sit in concentric rows beneath its boughs the gem of the place however is neither the big marronnier nor the collegial church nor the mighty dungeon nor the hideous prisons of louis the eleventh it is simply the tomb of agnes sorel la belle des belles so many years the mistress of charles the seventh she was buried in fourteen fifty in the collegial church whence in the beginning of the present century her remains with the monument that marks them were transferred to one of the towers of the castle she has always i know not with what justice enjoyed a fairer fame than most ladies who have occupied her position and this fairness is expressed in the delicate statue that surmounts her tomb it represents her lying there in lovely demureness her hands folded with the best modesty a little kneeling angel at either side of her head and her feet hidden in the folds of her decent robe resting upon a pair of couchant lambs innocent reminders of her name agnes however was not lamb-like inasmuch as according to a popular tradition at least she exerted herself sharply in favour of the expulsion of the english from france it is one of the suggestions of loche that the young charles the seventh hard put to it as he was for a treasury and a capital le roi de bourges as he was called at paris was yet a rather privileged mortal to stand up as he does before posterity between the noble joan and the gentille agnes deriving however much more honour from one of these companions than from the other almost as delicate a relic of antiquity as this fascinating tomb is the exquisite oratory of anne of brittany among the apartments of the castle the only chamber worthy of note this small room hardly larger than a closet and forming part of the addition made to the edifice by charles the seventh is embroidered over with the curious and remarkably decorative device of the ermine and festooned cord the objects in themselves are not especially graceful but the constant repetition of the figure on the walls and ceiling produces an effect of richness in spite of the modern whitewash with which if i remember rightly they have been endued the little streets of loche wander crookedly down the hill and are full of charming pictorial bits an old town gate passing under a mediaeval tower which is ornamented by gothic windows and the empty niches of statues a meagre but delicate hotel de ville of the renaissance nestling close beside it a curious chancellerie of the middle of the sixteenth century with mythological figures and a latin inscription on the front both of these latter buildings being rather unexpected features of the huddled and precipitous little town loche has a suburb on the other side of the andre which we had contented ourselves with looking down at from the heights 
while we wondered whether, even if it had not been getting late, and our train were more accommodating, we should care to take our way across the bridge and look up that bust in terracotta of Francis I, which is the principal ornament of the Chateau de Sansac and the Faubourg of Beaulieu. I think we decided that we should not, that we were already quite well enough acquainted with the nasal profile of that monarch. Chapter 11 I know not whether the exact limits of an excursion, as distinguished from a journey, have ever been fixed. At any rate, it seemed none of my business at Tours to settle the question. Therefore, though the making of excursions had been the promise of my stay, I thought it vain, while I started for Bourges, to determine to which category that little expedition might belong. It was not till the third day that I returned to Tours, and the distance, traversed for the most part after dark, was even greater than I had supposed. That, however, was partly the fault of a tiresome wait at Vierzon, where I had more than enough time to dine very badly at the buffet, and to observe the proceedings of a family who had entered my railway carriage at Tours, and had conversed unreservedly for my benefit all the way from that station a family whom had entertained me to assign to the class of petite noblesse de province. Their noble origin was confirmed by the way they all made maigre in the refreshment room, it happened to be a Friday, as if it had been possible to do anything else. They ate two or three omelettes apiece and ever so many little cakes, while the positive, talkative mother watched her children as the waiter handed about the roast fowl. I was destined to share the secrets of this family to the end, for when I had taken place in the empty train that was in waiting to convey us to Bourges, the same vigilant woman pushed them all on top of me into my compartment, though the carriages on either side contained no travellers at all. It was better, I found, to have dined, even on omelettes and little cakes, at the station at Vierzon rather than at the hotel at Bourges, which, when I reached it at nine o'clock at night, did not strike me as the prince of hotels. The inns in the smaller provincial towns of France are all, as the term is, commercial, and the commis voyageur is in triumphant possession. I saw a great deal of him for several weeks after this, for he was apparently the only traveller in the southern provinces, and it was my daily fate to sit opposite to him at table d'hôte and in railway trains. He may be known by two infallible signs. His hands are fat, and he tucks his napkin into his shirt collar. In spite of these idiosyncrasies, he seemed to me a reserved and inoffensive person, with singularly little of the demonstrative good humour that he had been described as possessing. I saw no one who reminded me of Balzac's illustre Gaudissart, and indeed in the course of a month's journey through a large part of France, I heard so little desultory conversation that I wondered whether a change had not come over the spirit of the people. They seemed to me as silent as Americans when Americans have not been introduced, and infinitely less addicted to exchanging remarks in railway trains and at table d'hôte than the colloquial and cursory English a fact perhaps not worth mentioning were it not at variance with that reputation which the french have long enjoyed of being a pre-eminently sociable nation the common report of the character of a people is however an indefinable product and it is apt to strike the traveller who observes for himself as very wide of the mark the english who have for ages been described mainly by the french as the dumb stiff unapproachable race present to-day a remarkable appearance of good humour and garrulity, and are distinguished by their facility of intercourse. On the other hand, any one who has seen half a dozen Frenchmen pass a whole day together in a railway carriage without breaking silence, is forced to believe that the traditional reputation of these gentlemen is simply the survival of some primitive formula. It was true, doubtless, before the Revolution, but there have been great changes since then. The question of which is the better taste, to talk to strangers or to hold your tongue, is a matter apart. I incline to believe that the French reserve is the result of a more definite conception of social behaviour. I allude to it only because it is at variance with the national fame, and at the same time is compatible with a very easy view of life in certain other directions. On some of these latter points, the boule d'or at Bourges was full of instruction, 
boasting as it did of a hall of reception in which amid old boots that had been brought to be cleaned old linen that was being sorted for the wash and lamps of evil odour that were awaiting replenishment a strange familiar promiscuous household life went forward small scullions in white caps and aprons slept upon greasy benches the boots sat staring at you while you fumbled helpless in a row of pigeonholes for your candlestick or your key and amid the coming and going of the commis voyageurs a little seamstress bent over the undergarments of the hostess the latter being a heavy stern silent woman who looked at people very hard it was not to be looked at in that manner that one had come all the way from tours so that within ten minutes after my arrival i sallied out into the darkness to get somehow and somewhere a happier impression however late in the evening i may arrive at a place i cannot go to bed without an impression the natural place at bourges to look for one seemed to be the cathedral which moreover was the only thing that could account for my presence dans cette galere i turned out of a small square in front of the hotel and walked up a narrow sloping street paved with big rough stones and guiltless of a footway it was a splendid starlit night the stillness of a sleeping ville de province was over everything i had the whole place to myself i turned to my right at the top of the street where presently a short vague lane brought me into sight of the cathedral i approached it obliquely from behind it loomed up in the darkness above me enormous and sublime it stands on the top of the large but not lofty eminence over which bourges is scattered a very good position as french cathedrals go for they are not all so nobly situated as chartres and laon on the side on which i approached it the south it is tolerably well exposed though the precinct is shabby in front it is rather too much shut in these defects however it makes up for on the north side and behind where it presents itself in the most admirable manner to the garden of the archeveche which has been arranged as a public walk with the usual formal alleys of the jardin francais i must add that i appreciated these points only on the following day as i stood there in the light of the stars many of which had an autumnal sharpness while others were shooting over the heavens the huge rugged vessel of the church overhung me in very much the same way as the black hull of a ship at sea would overhang a solitary swimmer it seemed colossal stupendous a dark leviathan the next morning which was lovely i lost no time in going back to it and found with satisfaction that the daylight did it no injury the cathedral of bourges is indeed magnificently huge and if it is a good deal wanting in lightness and grace it is perhaps only the more imposing i read in the excellent handbook of m Jouan that it was projected dès mille cent soixante douze but commenced only in the first years of the thirteenth century the nave the writer adds was finished tant bien que mal faute de ressources the facade is of the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries in its lower part and of the fourteenth in its upper the allusion to the nave means the omission of the transepts the west front consists of two vast but imperfect towers one of which the south is immensely buttressed so that its outline slopes forward like that of a pyramid being the taller of the two if they had spires these towers would be prodigious as it is given the rest of the church they are wanting in elevation there are five deeply recessed portals all in a row each surmounted with a gable the gable over the central door being exceptionally high above the porches which give the measure of its width the front rears itself piles itself on a great scale carried up by galleries arches windows sculptures and supported by the extraordinarily thick buttresses of which i have spoken and which though they embellish it with deep shadows thrown sidewise do not improve its style the portals especially the middle one are extremely interesting they are covered with curious early sculptures the middle one however i must describe alone it has no less than six rows of figures the others have four some of which notably the upper one are still in their places the arch at the top is three tiers of elaborate imagery 
The upper of these is divided by the figure of Christ in judgment of great size, stiff and terrible, with outstretched arms. On either side of him are ranged three or four angels, with the instruments of the Passion. Beneath him, in the second frieze, stands the angel of justice with his scales, and on either side of him is the vision of the last judgment. The good prepare, with infinite titillation and complacency, to ascend to the skies, while the bad are dragged, pushed, hurled, stuffed, crammed into pits and cauldrons of fire. There is a charming detail in this section. Beside the angel on the right, where the wicked are the prey of demons, stands a little female figure, that of a child, who with hands meekly folded and head gently raised, waits for the stern angel to decide upon her fate. In this fate, however, a dreadful big devil also takes a keen interest. He seems on the point of appropriating the tender creature. He has a face like a goat and an enormous hooked nose. But the angel gently lays a hand upon the shoulder of the little girl. The movement is full of dignity, as if to say, no, she belongs to the other side. The frieze below represents the general resurrection with the good and wicked emerging from their sepulchres. Nothing can be more quaint and charming than the difference shown in the way of responding to the final trump. The good get out of their tombs with a certain modest gaiety, an alacrity tempered by respect. One of them kneels to pray as soon as he has disinterred himself. You may know the wicked, on the other hand, by their extreme shyness. They crawl out slowly and fearfully, they hang back and seem to say, oh dear. These elaborate sculptures, full of ingenuous intention and of the reality of early faith, are in a remarkable state of preservation. They bear no superficial signs of restoration and appear scarcely to have suffered from the centuries. They are delightfully expressive. The artist had the advantage of knowing exactly the effect he wished to produce. The interior of the cathedral has a great simplicity and majesty, and, above all, a tremendous height. The nave is extraordinary in this respect. It dwarfs everything else I know. I should add, however, that I am in architecture always of the opinion of the last speaker. Any great building seems to me, while I look at it, the ultimate expression. At any rate, during the hour I sat gazing along the high vista of Bourges, the interior of the great vessel corresponded to my vision of the evening before. There is a tranquil largeness, a kind of infinitude, about such an edifice. It soothes and purifies the spirit, it illuminates the mind. There are two aisles on either side in addition to the nave, five in all, and, as I have said, there are no transepts, an omission which lengthens the vista, so that from my place near the door the central jewelled window in the depths of the perpendicular choir seemed a mile or two away. The second or outward of each pair of aisles is too low, and the first too high. Without this inequality the nave would appear to take an even more prodigious flight. The double aisles pass all the way around the choir, the windows of which are inordinately rich in magnificent old glass. I have seen glass as fine in other churches, but, I think, I have never seen so much of it at once. Beside the cathedral on the north is a curious structure of the 14th or 15th century, which looks like an enormous flying buttress, with its support sustaining the north tower. It makes a massive arch, high in the air, and produces a romantic effect as people pass under it to the open gardens of the Archeveche, which extend to a considerable distance in the rear of the church. The structure supporting the arch has the girth of a largish house, and contains chambers with whose uses I am unacquainted, but to which the deep pulsations of the cathedral, the vibration of its mighty bells, and the roll of its organ tones must be transmitted even through the great arm of stone. The archiepiscopal palace, not walled as in Tours, is visible as a stately habitation of the last century, now in course of reparation in consequence of a fire. From this side, and from the gardens of the palace, the nave of the cathedral is visible in all its great length and height, with its extraordinary multitude of supports. The gardens aforesaid, accessible through tall iron gates, 
are the promenade, the Tuileries of the town, and very pretty in themselves, are immensely set off by the overhanging church. It was warm and sunny, the benches were empty, I sat there a long time in that pleasant state of mind which visits the traveller in foreign towns when he is not too hurried, while he wonders where he had better go next. The straight unbroken line of the roof of the cathedral was very noble, but I could see from this point how much finer the effect would have been if the towers, which had dropped almost out of sight, might have been still carried higher. The archiepiscopal gardens looked down at one end over a sort of esplanade or suburban avenue lying on a lower level on which they open, and where several detachments of soldiers, bourges full of soldiers, had just been drawn up. The civil population was also collecting, and I saw that something was going to happen. I learned that a private of the chasseurs was to be broken for stealing, and everyone was eager to behold the ceremony. Sundry other detachments arrived on the ground, besides many of the military who had come as a matter of taste. One of them described to me the process of degradation from the ranks, and I felt for a moment a hideous curiosity to see it, under the influence of which I lingered a little. But only a little. The hateful nature of the spectacle hurried me away, at the same time that others were hurrying forward. As I turned my back upon it, I reflected that human beings are cruel brutes, though I could not flatter myself that the ferocity of the thing was exclusively French. In another country the concourse would have been equally great, and the moral of it all seemed to be that military penalties are as terrible as military honours are gratifying. End of section 5